Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, your host, Harry Simiou. Delighted to say I've got a very special guest uh, back with me for the first time in a little while, uh, Mr. Mike Stavrou, now the producer of a podcast that's won a British Podcast Award. Welcome back, Mr. Stavrou, and congratulations on your achievement. How are you, sir? Too big Thank time you, for us now. <laughs> that's uh that's very kind of you yeah it was a it was a great thing especially given that we had gary lineker in our category so you know it's pretty some pretty uh big hitters in there so it was it was good to have that accolade man yeah cheers what you're trying to say is that mike stavrou these days is massive just say it it's cool you can say it <laughs> i'll let you say it mate i'll let you say it <laughs> how have you been um how are things how are you feeling about the season so far it dawned on me today that we're like a quarter of the way through, which is like mad because it feels like we're still at the kind of early stages of the season. But how are you feeling about Arsenal generally at the moment? I know there's been a lot of discourse in recent weeks. The Bournemouth result really kind of added to that, didn't it? In terms of sort of people starting to ask questions about our approach and mm. about the manager and some of the players and maybe the signing of Mikel Marino, whether or not that was the right thing. Where are you at at the moment in terms of Arsenal? I think myself, Harry, I, I don't know why, but I've, I've felt sort of weirdly disconnected this season. Uh, and I don't know whether that's, uh, you'll know as well, and I, I know people at level struggle to relate to this in particular, but I think when you're covering the club and and covering not only the club, but football in general, you kind of almost have to take yourself out of the Arsenal bubble a little bit. Um, and just because, you know, we work for, for places that you know, you have to be objective, essentially. So a lot of the time you have to strip back that emotion. Um, and, you know, after a game with Arsenal, you look on Twitter, there's all these conspiracy theories about refereeing decisions and this going their way and not going that way. What's the reason for this? You kind of have to almost strip that element back and look at it with a more objective view. That's not to say that, you know, no fan is 100% objective because otherwise you wouldn't really be a fan and there's always going to be certain biases and, and things like that. But I don't know why for this season, just because of the football that we've seen, and we're going to get into, you know, the, the reasons for it. It has been a bit more defensive. It's not been as gung ho. Um, I feel like we've not played to the best of our potential. Uh, so I almost when that sort of gung ho attacking football is not there, I think it's a little bit easy to disconnect from it, and especially when in the backdrop you have not only City winning games without you know, their best players in Rodri and De Bruyne. But you've also got Liverpool who look really good. They like, let's, you know, I think we have to, we have to be honest and say they're not, you know, the team that they were when Jurgen Klopp was in charge, but they've got a new manager. And, you know, you look at how Arsenal performed after Wenger left and how uh, United performed after Sir Alex Ferguson left. The drop-off was unbelievable. So the fact that they've kept that consistency going is 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 pretty special. So so yeah, I'm feeling mixed, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I've been disconnected because I feel like it's been quite a heavy start to the season, but what I would say is the emotional drain that I feel normally at the back end of a campaign is maybe setting a little bit earlier this time because we're not turning up every week essentially knowing what we're going to get. We haven't really had a game in a while where Arsenal went out and completely battered somebody. You think about our recent league results, games that we were expected to win comfortably. Leicester, that wasn't the case. Southampton, that wasn't really the case. Um, Shakhtar Donetsk, even in the Champions League. I mean, I looked at that game and I thought after the, the shit show that we saw at Bournemouth a few days earlier, like it would have been great to just go out there and put on a show and kind of get everybody back connected and back engaged. Now, again, I'm not saying that I'm disconnected, but I feel like some of the emotions I'm going through right now, it's a little bit early in the season for me to be feeling them. And that does worry me. It does concern me. I look at the Premier League table right now, and I don't want to go overboard on this because I was speaking on the, the post Liverpool pod and I was talking about the fact that it hasn't got me um, panicked just yet. I look at the fact that, you know, City are, what, five points ahead of us right now. I, in my own head, 
figure that out to be two points because I think if we want to be champions, we've got to beat them at the Emirates. So I take three points out of that. I look at Liverpool, who are currently four points ahead of us. And I think, yes, that's a problem because they've already been to Emirates Stadium and we need to go to Anfield. However, I don't rate them as highly as I rate Manchester City. Even after yesterday, I thought, in, and we're recording this on Monday, by the way, I thought in, in long periods, in the first half especially, we were much better than them. We were the much better side. But we didn't take enough of a lead to be able to protect ourselves against what then happened in the second half, which was rotten luck hitting us again. Gabriel going off, Timber going off, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which really weakened us. But so I'm I'm not saying I'm panicked right now about the league table because I'm not. But you look at the games that we've got coming up, Mike. We go away to Newcastle on Saturday, and the following weekend we go away to Chelsea. Now, how can I not be looking ahead? And feeling a little bit concerned and a little bit worried because we could quite easily go and drop points in both of those games based on the way that we're playing at the moment. And if that is to happen, then you would look at the table, wouldn't you, with some real concern going into kind of mid-November? Yeah, and, and you're completely right. And I think we, you know, we have to look at that um, where we've dropped points this season and it's so early on, but uh, you know, picking up one point out of Brighton and Bournemouth, you know, for for a league, for, for a team wanting to win the Premier League, that is just, for me, that's not good enough. Uh, it's so early on in the season. Because we look at last season and where we dropped points and where we thought, you know, maybe the title was was won and lost. Because, look, you can, you can drop points against bitter rivals, um, just like the Liverpool game yesterday, and say, you know what, they're a good team. Yeah, maybe they're not at City's level, but you know, they, they were deserving of the point, I would say. But then where you can't justify that is, look, last season, outside of the the big six, I'm not including Villa in this, but, you know, um, Fulham draw, West Ham loss and Fulham loss again. I mean, if we're looking at it comparatively, um, we're not that far behind in terms of where we can afford to lose points against teams that aren't competing with us, essentially, or or aren't far behind us. So there's not much margin for error here is, is my point, essentially. And the fact that we've you know had those setbacks earlier on in the season, we're going to need a huge run now, essentially. And with those games that you're talking about coming up, that's going to be difficult. Um, and with the injuries that we've got, that's going to be difficult. So I think the start to the season is just not filling me with with positivity and essentially because we know like we've we've done this dance before. And I guess this is one of the drawbacks of when you are a really good team, we become hypercritical. Um, so, you know, when maybe if this happened two years ago, we would be saying, oh yeah, but we've had a decent start to the season. And, you know, we've got decent results here and there, beat, beat Villa away from home, got draws against Man City and Liverpool. Uh, but now, because we know the margins are so tight, we just can't afford to, to have that essentially. Okay. So let me try and put a slightly different spin on it. Cause I feel like we've got off to a bit of a negative start, um, <laughs> on the pod, but let me put a different spin on it. Then mm. you mentioned some of the games that we dropped points in last season, West Ham, Fulham, et cetera, et cetera. Should we then take that, which was obviously a bit of a blip, but we were ultimately able to recover from that and we took the title race right down to the final day. So having seen that before, should we be more relaxed and should we look at this and say, okay, it is a blip. We're going to have them during the season but this team have shown us before that they have the capacity to recover and put really strong runs of form together that will ultimately get us back to where we need to be. Because I've said this repeatedly over the last few days when people have been talking about the title race and, you know, maybe where we sit in the table, the fact that we're five points off right now. I did expect at this stage for us to be off the pace because of the fixtures that we've had. And then if you factor in the injury problems and all the other issues, referees being card happy with us rather than, um, you know, giving us a fair crack of the whip in comparison to what we're seeing elsewhere every week. Is it a case of actually look at the fact that we had those dips last season, look at the fact that we were able to recover from them. And rather than getting down in the dumps, we should be saying, OK, we've been through this before and we know we can come out the other side. So let's all stay calm. We know it's not going as we want it to 100 percent right now, but let's stay calm and trust in Mikel Arteta and this team to come through at the other side stronger. Yeah, look, I, I agree with you. And I, I think the the good thing is, is that we're, you know, 
we're getting along okay without key players. And so that means that when those players come back, then our ceiling is is going to be a lot higher. Um, so, you know, Odegaard should be back soon. We obviously don't know about the injury to Gabriel, but to be honest, I think even if Gabriel was out for a little while, you know, uh, White and Saliba, I think, can can cover adequately. I think the, the probably the main area for injuries worries is at fullback because I think we've not got, you know, we've not even got our our third choice fullback in 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 some situations. Um, so, so yeah, you're right. The the capability is there to go on one of them runs, and it, it, it's it's good to know that we can do that city esque run towards the end of the season when we know that, that that we have to. I think what needs to sort of improve is just consistency across the board, uh, and I think that starts with obviously fixing this disciplinary problem that, that we have. Um, you so know, you, three think, red, you think three you red think cards, we've got a disciplinary problem. Well, I think I, I think if you look at them in 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 isolation, um, they can all be explained away. But I think the fact they happen in a, in a cluster, um, and especially because two of them were similar with with kicking the ball away, um, I kind of feel like you can learn from that situation. And I think what Mikel Arteta will be saying to his team now is that look, just don't give them the opportunity to to you know punish you for any of these small errors. And I know that obviously you know every Arsenal fan is going to. And what happens at every game now is scream when a player kicks the ball away like like Luis Diaz did on um on Sunday. But I think those are things that you can slightly tweak your mentality to say, look, um, these things are going against us at the moment. So what can we do to 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 fix that? And I think that can be easily done. So I'm not I'm not worried about that. Um and I think once you, you know, fix these marginal things, they'll all add up into a into a bigger thing. So it's about you know, making sure that we're on our best behavior, getting those players back, um, and finally trying to rid ourselves of this tag that we're Stoke 2.0, because that that is really winding me up, to be honest. Um, I don't know where this has come from. Yeah, I'm I'm frustrated by all the talk around us being this negative team all of a sudden that don't want to win football matches. For example, Manchester City, you go down to 10 men, I think it's absolutely the right thing when you're winning the game to try and protect that lead. I think when you go to um, you, when you go on to Sunday's case where you know we're two one up at the break and we lose two of our back four, our best two of our back four, by the way, and we have to adapt it and change it, and then we naturally just sort of retreat a little bit. I think that's completely to be expected, and so I don't think for a second that Arsenal have reverted to being this negative team. I think at times when Arsenal have found it difficult to be effective going the other way. They've leaned on what is one of their major strengths, which is being able to set up in a more defensive and pragmatic way and believing in their ability to hold on to what they've got. I just want to pick up on the the point about the disciplinary thing, though. Mm. I, I disagree with you. Um, I don't think it is a discipline problem. I think if you're talking about players going out there and making bad challenges, or getting caught up in sort of scuffles with people and, you know, that kind of thing, then I think you can look at it and you can say disciplinary issue. My issue with labelling what we've had as that is that these are things that 99% of the time in our division go unpunished. And that's my problem with it. Like, we're trying to play on the edge because that's what Mikel Arteta has brought to the table. If you go back to the season before last, you remember everybody used to say we were too emotional. Mm. And what he did at the beginning was try and generate that emotion that was missing towards the end of the Wenger days and certainly missing during the Unai Emery days. And he tried to bring that back and maybe went a little bit too far at the beginning and it did cause us problems and we did get a lot of red cards. Last season, we saw a bit of a better balance with that. This season, I just think there's such innocuous incidents, Mike, that for, like I get that they're avoidable. Like I get that the Trossard one especially was avoidable. Um, the Saliba thing, I mean, uh, we've seen countless examples over the last two weeks where players in similar situations were denying what was more of a goal scoring opportunity and only got booked. So I think we can feel hard done by with that one. But I just think the nature of those incidents is is not something that I put down to a lack of discipline or the way that Arteta is coaching us. And instead, I'm going to point at the inconsistency in the officiating. I mean, I'm interested to get your thoughts on what happened against Liverpool as well, the 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 incident where Anthony Taylor decided to blow his whistle um, after 
what looked like a fair challenge from Jakub Kivior. Is that okay to say? Fair to say? I mean, you're wincing. <laughs> I think I mean at the time, so I was I was uh, in the North Bank for that, so it was right right there, and I didn't think it, it was anything. On looking back, I guess you could make a case that he's almost jumped into him, and and look, it always looks worse when a player's not jumped at all, and then someone's almost like climbing over him. That for optically, that that does look worse, but I don't think. I mean, I don't understand the, the thought process of the referee first and foremost. I don't understand why. You would see that and then blow your whistle a few seconds later, um, just before the the goal goes in, because surely you want to see what develops, right? Um, if you're gonna pause, otherwise you just blow up straight away. So first and foremost, I don't understand what he was thinking there. Yeah, if he blows straight away, then I'm okay with it. But when I watched yeah. the replay back, he took an absolute age to actually put the whistle yeah. to his mouth and blow by which time he can see that something's developing here and maybe he should stop and just wait and see what develops and, and how it pans out. And then use the VAR, guys. That's what it's there for. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go and check and, and make a more informed decision. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, we've talked about the title race in general, where we're kind of at on that, um, a little bit below where we want to be. I, I do worry, Mike, that in two weeks, and I don't want to say this because I feel like I've... <laughs> I feel like I'm crossing over to the dark side in being a little bit negative, but I do really worry about what this league table is going to look like after our next two games. And that's not necessarily because I think that Man City and Liverpool are going to win all their games. I think neither of them are as strong right now as Manchester City sides of the past. Yeah. But it's because I look at us and I don't feel comfortable about us. Like, Let's talk a little bit about Bukayo Saka because... It was clear yesterday or, or Sunday, I should say, how impactful he was and is and how important he is to this team. Has the injury to him, along with the injury to Martin Odegaard, just been too much for us to handle at once? Well, yeah, no, I think it was really interesting because that, that Bournemouth game, I think it was the first time that neither Saka or Odegaard had started in the Premier League since the 2-0 lost to Brentford on the opening day, I think of 2021. Uh, that is a long time. Um, and that was before we even signed Odegaard on a permanent deal, by the way. Um, that's a long time to um, to have that as a core of your squad. And basically, you know, all of the play is funneled around them two. And essentially, we know we're very right side dominated. Um, and that was the case even even on Sunday against against Liverpool, without Odegaard, we just like to build up down that side. So the fact that both of them were missing was was a was a big big loss. Um, and Saka, like, just frankly, is is our best player. He can just make something happen out of nothing. Like that that chance that he had was difficult. I know people were saying, oh, you know, maybe Robertson's legs have kind of gone as he as he approaches uh sort of like early 30s and yeah maybe that's a factor but i just think the the sort of the sort of killer instinct that saka has these days to know that he can just take a touch inside and blast it into the near post it's just you know i don't think any wingers um are putting up that level of consistency in the premier league other than mohammed salah and mohammed salah is obviously a veteran so the fact that saka's doing that at, at his age and has done it so consistently for a long time is uh is, is amazing but i think what we were all hoping, and I don't want to dig anyone out, but I think what we were all hoping when the transfer window shut is that Raheem Sterling was going to be able to come in and take some minutes off Saka, whether that was, you know, so Saka could come off on the 75th minute or Saka could be rotated. But given not only how poor we look without Saka, but how poorly Raheem Sterling started, that's a real worry because we don't have that level of rotation that City have or even Liverpool have where you take a player out of your front line and the quality doesn't drop that much. Like look at uh, Sunday, you know, Jota's injured, Darwin Nunes comes in, sets up the goal, you know, puts himself about, has that bare minimum. And I think at, at the moment, I'm not seeing the bare minimum from Sterling, which is, you know, put yourself about, work hard, track back, um, let alone talking about the inconsistency of his, of his final third actions. Um, so I think that's the problem that we have at the moment is that our squad is is just not quite good enough so that when we have injuries or when someone needs a rest, we can't 
maintain the same levels. And maybe this goes back to what we we're talking about. The reason maybe when we don't have our full squad is that we lean on being slightly more defensive is because we can't have that same attacking impetus that we have when we have the full starting eleven fit. And I think that's where the where the issue lies at the moment. And it's it's a little bit concerning because, you know, we got kind of we've got kind of lucky with injuries over the last two seasons. I think for the majority, the the crux of our squad has been able to keep fit, you know, shown by that Odegaard and Saka stat Saka stat. But if we're not going to have that consistently this season, it's how do we deal with that? And I don't think we're dealing with that at the moment. So let me ask you a question. I know I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here. Go for it. But it kind of just popped up in my mind while you were speaking there. Based on what you've said there about the squad, looking at it now, nine games into the Premier League season, do you think we did enough in the summer transfer window? Because my mind has slightly changed on this. So do you think that we did enough during the summer transfer window? If you think about the major signings, Calafiori, Marino and Sterling, was that enough given where we were and where we're trying to get to? I think hindsight is twenty twenty, isn't it? Um, I know, I know, we're you, doing this with hindsight. I, I completely yeah, and accept that. But I guess on. with 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 transfer windows, you can only judge it on the information that you have at the time, right? Um, so it's so hard to to predict, and I think almost a lot of it is about how players fit into different positions and you know using past as a predictor of the future is is really difficult because it because if you would have looked at Raheem Sterling pre-Chelsea you would have said and we all said at, at the time I think this is a really good signing he's really experienced he's won titles um you look at Gabriel Jesus uh pre-injury and he's a player who he comes in there's no drop off now when you're bringing those players in there's a huge drop off I mean Gabriel Jesus is, is another one Who's just not at the at the level that that we need? Um, I mean, I don't think Sterling was even in the squad, was he, against Liverpool? And that and that. that to me is 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 kind of worrying. If I've not got that wrong, I think that is a bit of a worrying sign. The fact that we didn't think that we could turn to you know multiple Premier League winner, um, or he didn't come on at least at the he very was, yeah he, he at, was at in the least. squad, but he, he was in the squad. Sorry, yeah. But the fact he did, the fact he didn't come on is kind of concerning to me and we, we would rather bring on Ethan Wanneri, who's very inexperienced compared to him is, is a concern. And, um, but to answer your original question, I mean, I guess the thinking was, is that, um, we'd have cover adequate cover. So with striker, we could rotate habits out and play Jesus, but that's not worked out. We could take out Saka, rotate in Sterling. Um, but it's just not work. So whether you could go back to that perennial debate that we keep having as Arsenal fans, should we have signed a striker? Um, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I mean, going into the summer window, my my view was we needed one more defender, which we got in Ricardo Calafiori. And I think we got someone who could cover in a couple of defensive positions, left back, centre back, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted us to bring in a midfielder and we were in pursuit of Mikel Marino throughout the, the entire summer. It took ages to get the deal done, but we'd done it in the end. And then the Sterling one, yeah, in isolation, I looked at it and I thought, well, that's a good get because it's the final day of the window, not paid anything for him. We've managed to get him on loan for a really low amount of money and it works really, really well. Do you think, though, that Mikel Arteta is showing us that he doesn't trust in some of these players right now to perform at the level that he requires. Because you mentioned there that Raheem Sterling didn't come on and that he turned to, you know, Ethan Waneri first um, before he turned to him. And then I think about another one, Alexander Zinchenko. You chose to bring on Miles Lewis Skelly, an 18-year-old who has been brought up, by the way, as a midfield player and has recently changed to left back. You decided to bring him on over an experienced Alexander Zinchenko, who's won a number of titles with Manchester City. He's 27 years old. He's been around the block. He's done it before. I know that there were question marks around how fit he was, given that he's barely featured of late. But I just I looked at that and I thought, is this Arteta sending us a message? Is he basically saying that players that I might have previously relied on We've moved past them now and they're not quite at the level that we require. Is, is that fair to say? 
I mean, uh, it's, it's it's evident, isn't it, by by what you've just explained? And I think if you were to say that to Arsenal fans when we saw the impact that Jesus and Sinjenko had when they first arrived, you probably wouldn't believe it. You probably wouldn't believe that we'd be in a situation where we're challenging for a title when they're not even coming on as substitutes, let alone being rotation options. Um, so it is. It is, it is interesting. I don't know whether and how that's going to improve. I mean, Jesus is a is a really funny one because, you know, I think we were saying in pre-season, oh, you know, he's he looks like he's getting back to it. Um, but he's just not, he's not kicked on. And I don't really know the, the reasons for that. I mean, is, is it a lack of confidence? Is he still fitness-wise not quite there where he was before? Does he not trust his knee? I mean, there's so many questions that we don't know because we simply you know, don't see enough of him on the pitch. But then when we do, he's not, he's just not at that level. Um, and I think if you, you know, go back to Man City, because they're always the the sort of comparison that, that that we look to. But what they tend to do is give, you know, all of their players around 25 starts in, in the Premier League. And that, that for me shows trust. You have trust that these players can, can be swapped in and swapped out and know that the level doesn't drop. And that, sadly i just don't think we we have that i think when the when the squad's fit and when it's you know when we've got them all lined up i think it's a very very strong squad but i just think that i mean <laughs> i think about the back four that ended that game harry and and i i would be scared if that back four played again or started the game even you know against a a, a sort of lower team i would be worried like even if that te- even if that back four played against preston i'm not saying i'd be worried um, but I wouldn't be comfortable watching that because I just don't think that's it. It, it kind of reminded me of like a, a late Wenger era back four that's just like sort of patched together. We've got a few injuries and, you know, just put like there's a there's a youngster in there. There's Kivior who we don't really fancy and then Ben White holding it all together. But he's not played in, at centre back for a long time. Do you know what I mean? It was all out, out of sorts. Yeah. I, and I completely agree with that. But then that takes me back around in a kind of full circle to then do we have to cut Mikel Arteta some slack right now? Because he is clearly dealing with some really difficult circumstances. I know everybody has injuries, but the last two weeks where we've been really kind of questioning Arsenal's performances, because, you know, people keep talking about the Southampton game and the Leicester game, but we won them. Like we won both those games. We beat Shakhtar Donetsk. I know people highlight that game as one where we were a little bit below it, but again, we won the game. The only game that we've actually lost was the Bournemouth game And we drop points against Brighton, which I can kind of live with because I think the circumstances around that Mm. were badly impacted by what I believe to be maybe the worst refereeing decision that I've seen in 10 years in the Premier League. Like to to send someone off for that, it's not the sport that any of us want to watch. We've been over that a million and one times. I won't go down that rabbit hole again, but I think I could kind of live with the Brighton defeat because I I had something to blame. I had a reason to look at it. The Bournemouth one, Again, players missing, but that team still should have performed better. That was my thing with the Bournemouth game. It wasn't that we lost it necessarily. It was how badly we played, um, how out of sorts we looked. And that really caused concern. Yesterday, you know, or or I keep saying yesterday because we're recording this on Monday, but I'll be with you on Tuesday. But I keep thinking about that game on Sunday and I think to myself, am I happy with the point? Well, when you mentioned the back four that you did, then yeah, I'm happy with that point because we ended the game like that and we still didn't lose it. But then you're winning by two goals to one going into the last 10 minutes. You really want to see it out. So I feel like we were a few minutes away on two different occasions now this season from having a completely different outlook. If we held on at Man City for a few more seconds, then the outlook would be completely different. Even if we did lose to Bournemouth, if we had held on for another nine minutes against Liverpool, the outlook would be very, very different. So when I'm talking about the finest of margins, I start to question whether I can pin that on the manager or if Mm. it's other circumstances that have led to that outcome. Yeah, look, I think that's a really good point. And I think if you would have asked me a few weeks ago equally, um, how have we coped without Odegaard? I would have said pretty well, because I think that when Trossard has been on it, he's been a really good sort of not quite mimic of Odegaard but he's done the sort of you know his his role to 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 some level well um but when we've been playing midfields of party rice marino plus a pretty defensive back four um because that's what we have now we have um you know center backs that are playing at 
fullback. For me, that balance is off because you've got four, five, six, seven defensive players and you're only leaving three attackers to do all of that uh all of that creative but and that's not that for me like we've you know arteta has sort of had a a five five uh idea of how he wants to do things you know when when havertz came in came into the team when he was the midfielders because he wanted you know odegaard and havertz as the, as the tens and then the, then the three attackers and then you know a more defensive midfielder and then the left back would invert and for me that's completely flipped on its head to something that is a bit more defensive um and i think that right now is because of circumstances. I don't think that's that's what he wants to do. So I agree, we've got to cut him some slack. But it's just how we, you know, if if Odegaard was to get injured again or he his comeback is delayed a bit more, what is the option? Because for me, I, I don't know what you think, but I think Trossard is a quite a streaky player. I think he shows elements of being excellent. There's no doubt in his versatility. You know, his skill set is huge, but. Ultimately, what we get from Odegaard is a minimum seven out of ten every week. Sometimes it's a it's a nine, sometimes it's a ten, but the minimum you're going to get is seven. I feel like with Trossard that can drop below that. Um, so I think that's our biggest issue, and how we solve that is the is the million dollar question. But I just think the balance overall um, needs to be fixed. And maybe you know Arteta says when we're playing this more defensive trio in midfield, do we just give Ethan Wanneri a go? Because it's been discussed before. I don't know what you think about that. But I almost just think for the sake of balance for the team, yes, he might not be quite ready to play 90 minutes, you know, every week. But give him a go and see how the team looks, how it changes. I think the Nwaneri debate is really interesting because when we first learned that Martin Odegaard had suffered that injury and was going to be out for a period of time, my initial instinct and my initial response to that was don't throw Ethan Nwaneri in and expect him to morph into Martin Odegaard because A, he's not ready. B, it's massive shoes to fill. And C, not only is Martin Odegaard one of our best players and one of our most influential players in terms of the way we play the game, but he's also the club captain. So it felt to me like throwing one area in and saying, you go and be Martin Odegaard for two months was a massive gamble and something that had the potential to do the youngster damage. However, over time, when we've watched this Arsenal side struggle to create, struggle to carve people open. And as you say, there's been this imbalance between the number of defensive-minded players and the, the, the number of attack-minded players. The more that that's gone on, the more I look at it and I think, well, if you don't want to start him, fine. But there are scenarios where you could have thrown him on a lot earlier. Like you could have thrown him on at Bournemouth a lot earlier than he did. You could have used him against Shakhtar more. You know, there's... There's been games where we could have accommodated Ethan one area. And if he's not good enough, then what the hell is he doing in the squad? Mm. So, you know, this is the thing. We let Emil Smith-Rowe go, which I was fine with, um, but we lost a potential creative force there. We let Fabio Vieira go out on loan. I'm not saying that he would have solved our problems, but again, we let creative players go, lost one creative player in Martin Odegaard and never really had the means to deal with that. You're right about Trossard as well. He absolutely is a streaky player. He can go through three, four weeks where he's outstanding and then he can have three or four games where he's completely anonymous. And I think we're coming out of the back, hopefully, of that period now because I thought he was terrible in a couple of the recent games. I thought he essentially got William Saliba sent off at Bournemouth with that hospital yep. pass that he played in. Yep. Um, and I think he's been really, really below it. And I think, unfortunately, it, it's having a bit of a knock-on effect on Kai Havertz right now as well, who's mm -hmm. having to play like the centre forward, but also having to drop into the deeper positions because when Trossard's tasked with doing that, he's not been as effective, he's not been physical enough. So it is having an impact on the team for sure. I do want to talk a little bit before we go, Mike, about Mikel Marino. Um, what have you made of his start to life at Arsenal? I was someone who was quite, I guess I was okay with the signing, but it wasn't like this signing that blew my mind. I wasn't like over the moon about it. And I did start to question at one point, well, if Real Sociedad are going to dig their heels in this much, is is this the right thing to do? Or do we turn our attentions elsewhere? He's come in, he suffered that injury right at the start of his Arsenal career, which set him back. But what have you made of him based on what we have seen? It is early days, but what are your initial thoughts? Yeah, I think initially struggled to to get up to speed. Um, and we've seen this, we've seen this a lot uh with Arteta players. I think it 
it, it takes a lot to understand the, the system at hand and it can be a real adjustment. Um, if you would have asked me before Liverpool, I, I would have said I've been pretty disappointed. But I think we got what we wanted from him in that Liverpool game. I think we got the dual monster. Um, he was happy to, you know, absolutely go about his business, um, chasing people down, uh, making things happen as well on the ball. And I think we saw everything that that we need to see from him. But previously to that, I just thought we're not quite getting what we paid for, essentially, in that we wanted someone not to directly be the Granite Xhaka replacement, but someone who could have that physicality, um, keep us moving forward, uh, lead the press as well um, from, from the midfield standpoint. And I didn't feel that we were getting that. I mean, whether he's the answer to us long term, obviously it's impossible to know. But I think as well, we, you know, talking about balance, he's he's played in quite a few different positions. I think he started uh, on the right against Bournemouth of the of the three. Um, and some were saying, you know, he can play as the deepest as well. We've not seen him there. So he's been moved about. He's been playing with, with different players around him. And, and I think ultimately that culminates in a really difficult environment to get your feet under the table. And he's not, character-wise, he's not someone like Ricardo Calafiori because I look at Calafiori and I see this guy does not give a shit. <laughs> he's going to come in and play his front-footed way, the way that he's been doing it, you know, his whole career, no doubts. And I guess maybe that is slightly easier from left back because you've got you got a little bit more cover. Um, and just the way we play, the, the sort of left back is allowed to drift forward. But with Marino, if he goes marauding and it doesn't quite work out, you've got a huge gap in the middle of the pitch. Um, so it's an interesting contrast between them two. I definitely feel there's more to come though. And I, I feel like from what I've from what I've seen, there is quality there, but we're not we're not seeing the best of him. And I don't think we'll see the best of him until we get what I think is going to be our starting midfield three, which will be Rice as the six, Marino left eight, and Odegaard right eight. I think until we see that, we're not really going to be seeing the team in Arteta's image. And now we we're, we're probably saying that about Kai Havertz as well. Um, because that's what Arteta intended for him. So whether that changes over time, I, I don't know. But in my mind, that's why I think it will be our best trio. And I think we'll see Marino thrive in that. Yeah, I think we we already saw massive improvement in the Liverpool game when he was tasked with playing in a more conventional midfield role uh, alongside Declan Rice. He's had some decent cameos since coming to the club. But you think about that Bournemouth game, I was critical of Arteta after that game because I didn't think he... Managed it right after we went down to 10. I thought it was too negative in his approach that day. Um, and I thought it was a silly uh, decision to ask Mikel Moreno essentially to be Martin Odegaard for the day when that's such a million miles away from what his game is in all about. Um, you, you said it there, jewel monster. That's what he is. And to ask him to try and do the cute and intricate things in an area of the park where we're clearly lacking and we had no Saka either, it just didn't work. It was a complete and utter failure. However, yesterday or Sunday, again, I've done it again. It, that's the that's when I felt like we got a glimpse of what Mikel Marino actually is. Um, busy in the midfield alongside the Declan Rice, who looked 10 times better than he has all season because yeah. he was back in his best position, I think. And he looked a lot sharper and fitter, to be fair, as well, which surely played its part. But to have Marino in in the action where he should be, I think it made the world a difference. And he showed us what he can do from set pieces, which is, again, another reason why uh, Arsenal fans and Mikel Arteta especially were very keen to bring him in. So, yeah, I'm hoping now that we've kind of turned that Marino corner because I, like you, before the Liverpool game, we're sitting there going, was this the right decision? Um, you don't write people off at that early stage in their Arsenal careers, but you can ask questions. And I felt like we were certainly at that stage. Just before I let you go, Mike, um, some breaking news. Sammy Mockbell has reported this as we are live, uh, or I say live, as we are recording this episode. Uh, and he says that Martin Odegaard is scheduled to return to training on the grass this week. It's not clear yet when Mikel Arteta will deem him fit enough for selection, but this is huge, isn't it? Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> there is a God out there, Harry. Oh, it's, it's, oh, come on. We need him. <laughs> oh, we need it. Yeah. Honestly, like, as, as I say, everything, everything flows through him. He's the, the hub of our team. He, you know, is the first man to, in that press with, with Havertz. He literally is central to everything we do. He makes other players around him better. And he, crucially, he's our captain. So we've lacked that leadership as well, which I don't think we've, 
we've quite had. And look, the team are very cohesive and, you know, they put everything on the line. I don't think, you know, we've had bad performances over the last two years. I don't think anyone's come out and questioned the players' mentality like like they did used to do in the early days of Arteta. I don't think that's ever a question, but whether there's certain leadership on the pitch or, you know, whether that's by example or by vocalising it, I think he, he does that. So, and, and also... When he comes back, these people saying that we're like Stoke, it, 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 it's not going to work anymore because he he's such an elegant player to watch. Um, you know, he, as I say, combinations, make, making players better around him, making us tick. I, I feel like that is the answer to, to all of our problems. And I, and I know you can't just pin that on one player, but it it's felt like that, hasn't it? It's felt like we're really missing that cog um, and that driving force. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It doesn't matter how big a squad you think that you have. There are some players in this sport that we all love that are just so damn good that you cannot replace them. And you can never have in reserve someone anything like them. And that's the problem that we've got um, at this moment in time. We're trying to find ways of still utilizing a space on the pitch where we do our most damage without our most creative player in there. And unfortunately, we've suffered from that. As I say, I think it's important that we've stayed within touch and distance, within reach of, of the top two. Um, and look, if we can go and win at Newcastle, which is certainly far from impossible, like it's definitely something we're capable of, and we can go and win at Chelsea the following week, we'll be right back in there, right yeah. back in there, having proven so many critics wrong. So this next two weeks feels really, really important in terms of kind of defining our season. And it's mad for me to say that on match weeks 10 and 11. But I really do feel like we've had such a challenging start in comparison to everybody else, not just the injuries, but the fixtures too. And if we can come through that period, at least within reach, and I'm not saying we even have to be level on points with them or even within one point, two points of them, we have to be in the race. If we can come out the other side of this next two weeks in that position, then there's every reason to believe that this side with everybody back can get into that mode that we saw them sort of switch into in the second half of last season and give it a real good go. Um, give it a good go in Europe. Keep progressing in the Cups, hopefully. And um, it could still be a very, very rewarding and uh, and successful season. There's no need to be so downbeat. I feel like we've been a bit downbeat today. but uh, Yeah, I feel like right we've worked place. our way back, haven't we? Yeah, you got to, haven't you? Yeah. you got to. Never end on a low. Um, Brilliant. Mike, thank you so, so much for your time. As always, uh, let people know uh, how they can follow you, keep up with your great work, um, where they can listen to the podcasts that you uh, expertly produce. So it's uh, at Mike underscore Stavro on Twitter. And if you want to listen to the Athletic FC podcast, you can find it on Apple, Spotify, or if you're a subscriber on uh, the Athletic app as well brilliant stuff make sure you check it out uh, mike is the uh the brains behind uh the microphones does that make sense brains behind the microphone yeah it know. works yeah. yeah yeah it works you can take it you can take it uh, you can tell he doesn't produce this because the quality is absolutely dog shit but thank you uh, for listening <laughs> nice uh as always really really do appreciate uh you guys' support and we'll be back with another episode on wednesday morning where we'll look ahead to that game against preston north end um, in the Carabao Cup. How important is the Carabao Cup to Arsenal this season? We'll get into all of that on the next episode. Until then, take care of yourselves. Make sure you sign up to Patreon if you'd like to as well. Uh, there's a couple of bits on there um, that are exclusive to patrons. The match day reaction bit from the Emirates Stadium yesterday or on Sunday, I should say. And uh, there's an in-focus piece uh, with a focus on Ricardo Calafiori and his start to life at Arsenal. So do check those out. Remember to leave a like on the video if you're watching us. Subscribe to the channel. If you're new, if you're listening on audio, please do leave us a review and we'll be back for the next episode tomorrow morning. Until then, take care of yourselves. Goodbye.